Hello, my name is Mike Lynch. I am the medical director of the Pittsburgh Poison Center and a toxicologist at UPMC Presbyterian Hospital in Pittsburgh. Uh, today I'll be talking about toxicology and poison control. So disclosures up front, I have no financial or commercial interests uh, represented in this lecture to disclose. I am the medical director of the Pittsburgh Poison Center, um, but otherwise I have no financial interests. The objectives of this talk are really a broad overview of toxicology as to focus on any one part of toxicology could be a whole lecture in itself. I want the listeners to be able to understand basics of toxidromes, how to recognize, how to treat them, uh, the diagnostic approach to a toxicology patient regardless of what the ingestion or poison was, review basic treatment principles that apply to patients, again, almost regardless of what the specific ingestion was, and then to review a few of the real common specific intoxications, in particular acetaminophen, ethanol, and ethanol withdrawal, and aspirin or salicylate toxicity. So diving in with toxidromes, one of the most common toxidromes that we encounter is opioid toxicity. Uh, one important differentiation that I sometimes make is opioid versus opiate. Opioids is any medication that's derived synthetically from a morphine derivative, whereas an opiate would be codeine, morphine, uh, that are derived directly from poppy plants. So I may use them interchangeably, but truly I'm talking about opioids, which would include fentanyl, oxycodone, and other synthetics. So typical opioid toxicity, you can remember CPR as a mnemonic, coma, pinpoint pupils, and respiratory depression. That's really the triad of severe opioid toxicity uh, that we encounter. The treatment, as most people understand, for opioid toxicity is naloxone. However, I might argue that the more refined approach would be to know when and when not to give naloxone and how to dose appropriately so as not to cause uh, further damage. Naloxone or Narcan therapy is a hot-button topic currently, um, both politically as well as in the medical field, as pre-hospital providers, uh, including EMS, police, and fire, are having expanded roles for administering naloxone in the field to try to avert uh, cardiac arrest and death associated with uh, the growing amount of opioid ingestions associated with uh, death. So it's very important that we all understand this. So naloxone, as we all know, is a mu opioid receptor antagonist. Uh, and in somebody who is toxic, should fairly rapidly reverse the toxicity, allowing for awakening. And more importantly, really what our goal is, is to increase the respiratory rate and drive so that they're breathing. Ideally, in somebody who is acutely opioid toxic, the goal would be to improve their breathing and respiration, but not necessarily to fully arouse them. As somebody who is chronically addicted or dependent upon opioids uh, may have a severe reaction related to sudden onset of opioid withdrawal. While that typically wouldn't be a life-threatening process, it can still be dangerous as it can be associated with uh, non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema and certainly a lot of uh, discomfort for the patient, nausea, vomiting, pyloerection, tachycardia, agitation, uh, all those things can be seen. And in some cases, uh, when large doses of opioid, uh, of naloxone therapy are administered, say as in a pre-hospital situation where somebody may receive two milligrams, uh, the patient will then end up requiring sedation to treat the symptoms of rapid withdrawal. So there is sort of a, a sweet spot in between those two scenarios of um, not breathing well enough and unconscious uh, to agitated and very uncomfortable from withdrawal. We recommend typically a starting dose of 0.4 milligrams intravenously. Uh, that is typically enough to arouse most opioid toxicities. With some synthetics, such as fentanyl, we may require higher doses. So you can repeat the 0.4, or usually if the 0.4 doesn't work, I'll double it to give 0.8. And if that doesn't work, maybe then I'll go to two milligrams. If that isn't working, then Oftentimes, I'll move on to other therapies or just supporting their respiratory effort as it's unlikely to be opioid toxicity alone that's accounting for their, to for their toxidrome. When 
naloxone therapy works and the patient is awakened, but then after a course of a couple of hours becomes progressively more somnolent, that is when we would uh, consider an, a naloxone infusion. So with opioid therapy, as it is now with many long-acting options, including oxymorphone, MS-Contin, buprenorphine or suboxone therapy, uh, methadone, a lot of times those medications will last in the system longer than the naloxone will. The typical half-life for naloxone is about an hour, so you anticipate by about four hours it would be basically worn off. So we like to observe for approximately four hours after naloxone therapy. If they do become sedated, then we'll initiate the infusion, typically at a dose of about two-thirds of what the initial arousing dose was per hour. Oftentimes, though, folks who are chronically dependent or addicted to opioids will awaken from naloxone and wish to be discharged prior to that observational period. In that case, they are no longer inebriated since the effects are uh, reversed and they are able to make that decision with adequate capacity, assuming there's no other co-ingestions on board. In particular, uh, heroin arousal is a, is a common uh, uh, example of that, as heroin, unfortunately, heroin uh, typically does not cause a recurrent sedation after the naloxone wears off because it is relatively short-acting. Another common toxidrome that we uh, encounter is sympathomimetic toxicity. Uh, so certainly we're used to cocaine, amphetamines, uh, in many parts of the country methamphetamine uh, is, is very common. Um, there are other cathinone derivatives based on the West African, I'm sorry, East African and Middle Eastern plant cot uh, that is purified to cathinone, which can then sometimes be even further chemically altered, methyl methcathinone or uh, methylene dioxypyrovalerone, which are the two major constituents in uh, what were uh, in bath salts in the last few years. And those have actually been further chemically changed uh, to various other chemical uh, substituents, making them very difficult to identify in drug screens, but can lead to very significant sympathomimetic toxicity with or without uh, hallucinations as a primary uh, uh, manifestation. So in the hyperagenergic state, people with sympathomimetic toxicity would expect to see tachycardia, hypertension, potentially psychosis through the dopaminergic activity of most of these agents, agitation, you can see seizures, we would expect to see medriasis or dilated pupils, and diaphoresis. The diaphoresis can be a helpful differentiation from anticholinergic toxicity, which we'll talk about. So in the hyperagenergic state, uh, some of the complications of that can include myocardial infarctions, intracranial hemorrhages, um, and cardiac dysrhythmias, which can all be fatal. Uh, evaluation, obviously vital signs are vital, and that's why we get them. Uh, what is often missed is that temperature is probably the vital sign most associated with uh, morbidity and mortality and sympathomimetic toxicity. So hyperthermia is a very dangerous sign and uh, portends a very uh, poor uh, course uh, if, if the patient is significantly hyperthermic just because of their obvious increased metabolic activity uh, and agitation. Uh, other things to consider in addition to the typical tox evaluation would be to check a CPK as these people are at significant risk for rhabdomyolysis. Um, EKG, again, looking for dysrhythmia, uh, predisposition to dysrhythmia from QRS or QTC prolongation or ischemia. And then you may want to consider a CT scan of the head uh, in a patient who is agitated or otherwise altered, uh, particularly if they have had significant hypertension uh, given the risk of spontaneous intracranial hemorrhage. Treatment for sympathomimetic toxicity uh, is primarily going to be sedation. So benzos, benzos, benzos. And in toxicology, the treatment is almost always benzos. So when people are very agitated, we put them to sleep. Typically when people are asleep, we let them sleep and just make sure that they're breathing until it all wears off. Uh, because these patients are dangerous to themselves, potentially others, uh, when they're agitated. So large doses of benzodiazepines, whether it be lorazepam or diazepam, uh, midazolam, oftentimes are, are required uh, to, to treat these patients. So uh, typical first doses for lorazepam, maybe two to four milligrams IV, or for diazepam, 10 to 20 milligrams, and then rapidly titrate it up until you have lid lag and sedation, 
typically once you achieve sedation, uh, hemodynamic uh, properties will follow, so the cardiovascular toxicity will improve as well. In some cases, after adequate sedation, we may still see uh, occasional movements, choreoathetoid movements, hallucinations related to the dopamine-associated toxicity. In those cases, we uh, may recommend small doses of antipsychotics, in particular uh, haloperidol. A common term for that is, quote-unquote, crack dancing, where you'll see twitchy movements of the upper extremities or uh, almost looking like uh, dancing, even if they are adequately sedated. Next, anti-muscarinic or anticholinergic toxicity is very common. Uh, I refer to it in the slide as anticholinergic toxicity because that is the typical uh, nomenclature, but more appropriately, anti-muscarinic uh, would be the correct way of saying it as we're talking about blockade of muscarinic receptors. Uh, this is very common as there are many agents that cause muscarinic blockade. Antihistamines are a common class as well as tricyclic antidepressants. Most antipsychotics, especially some of the newer atypicals, such as olanzapine or clozapine, benztropine, which is often used in treatment with antipsychotics, uh, carbamazepine, and jimson weed is an example of a plant, and the picture that's uh, shown here is of a jimson weed pod. Within that pod are uh, hundreds of seeds, each containing atropine, and we mention it because this is not uncommonly abused by adolescents trying to get a, quote, high from the anti-muscarinic effects of jimson weed. So we certainly see patients um, presenting following ingestion of that. So the presentation, again, a lot of overlap with sympathomimetic toxicity. Tachycardia, uh, expect dry mucous membranes, medriasis, delirium. Uh, real typical uh, findings are mumbling speech. Uh, so they, they may be speaking, but it's a real low fish. <laughs> sort of sounds like that, and it's difficult to make out exactly what they're saying. Uh, while they're delirious, they may be able to give appropriate one-word responses. So if you say, where are you, they may say hospital. Um, but after that, they'll go off onto a tangent about fishing with their uncle in Lake Erie, and you don't know what they're talking about. So uh, that's a real typical sort of uh, presentation of anti-muscarinic. The other part of that is picking behavior, or carphologia is the medical term. And what that is, is they'll, whether it be their, their shirts, their bed sheets, uh, IV tubing, their oxygen, uh, things that they're seeing that you aren't, that they're reaching out for, but they're often picking with both hands. Uh, so it's a very common or classic toxidrome. Once you've seen it a few times, it's hard to miss. Uh, you know, we walk in, mouth is very dry, often the breath smells really bad because their mouth is dry and they're breathing through their mouth. Uh, lips are cracked, their pupils are very dilated. They're flushed, uh, mumbling and picking at things uh, are all the typical and classic uh, anti-muscarinic presentation. And then hallucinations, which they may or may not be able to describe very well. Again, the treatment, as I said, in toxicology treatment is almost always benzodiazepines. Part of the reason is they can become agitated, so for their own protection. Uh, typically, uh, with adequate doses of benzodiazepines, you can sedate them uh, to the point where they are no longer a danger to themselves. Uh, the other reason for use of benzodiazepines is many anti-muscarinic agents um, are also associated with seizure as part of the toxicity. So it's treatment as well as prophylaxis for that manifestation as well. Physostigmine is the antidote for antimuscarinic toxicity. It's a cholinesterase inhibitor. Uh, the reason that we use physostigmine as opposed to other cholinesterase inhibitors is it crosses the blood-brain barrier. And really what we're trying to treat is agitation and the CNS effects of antimuscarinic toxicity. So physostigmine does accomplish that. Typical dose in an adult would be one to two milligrams IV over a couple of minutes. Uh, and you'd expect relatively uh, rapid improvement in their toxicity over the course of five or so minutes. However, there are risks with physostigmine, including bradycardia, heart block, bronchospasm, bronchorrhea. So you wouldn't want to give it to somebody with severe COPD or asthma or somebody that's actively wheezing. Uh, the other potential risk would be lowering the seizure threshold. So you may cause seizures when you give it. Uh, so while we are careful and judicious with its use, it can be a useful adjunctive therapy, but I always give benzodiazepines first because of the risk of seizure.
GABA agonist toxicity and withdrawal. So GABA agonists and primarily benzodiazepines in this class uh, are very commonly used and abused in this country. Fortunately, the toxicity associated even with overdoses of large amounts of benzodiazepines are relatively benign. Uh, the classic presentation is coma with normal vital signs. So essentially, it's just an exaggeration of normal sleep. Uh, patients will be uh, have a normal heart rate, typically a normal blood pressure. Uh, it does not cause respiratory depression. Uh, GABA agonists, or I should say benzodiazepines alone, things like phenobarbital or other barbiturates can cause respiratory depression. And benzodiazepines in conjunction with other medications, uh, such as opioids or ethanol, uh, can have a synergistic depression in respiratory rate. However, on their own are not associated with a decrease in respiratory rate. What they can be associated with is an inability to protect your airway. Uh, so they, patients may need to be intubated in order to protect their airway from aspiration, uh, but otherwise uh, we don't recommend reversal. And the reason for that is uh, historically we have large data sets that show us that uh, patients with isolated benzodiazepine toxicity do very well with a very low mortality. However, flumazenil, the typical antidote or reversal agent for benzodiazepines is associated with uh, potential injury or poor outcomes, primarily from rapid induction of withdrawal in somebody who may be dependent on benzos. Um, and in that case, you could see delirium and seizures, which would be refractory to treatment because you're blocking the very receptor you'd be, you'd be using to treat it. Uh, so they'd be resistant to further benzodiazepine therapy until the flumazenil wore off. If it is used, uh, it should be remembered that the half-life for flumazenil, similar to Narcan, is often much shorter than the GABA agonist or benzodiazepine that was ingested. So you may expect that the flumazenil will wear off, requiring either repeat doses or further supportive care at that point. Um, times that I would consider flumazenil is in children who are clearly not dependent on benzodiazepines, particularly if it can avoid intubation. Uh, the other time, or the other population would be those uh, in whom it was given iatrogenically as a form of sedation for a procedure uh, if a good history was obtained prior and there was no history of benzodiazepine dependence. When you do see withdrawal, it can be severe and even life-threatening uh, because of delirium and seizures. Uh, withdrawal states from GABA agonists can be, uh, can be difficult to differentiate from sympathomimetic toxicity, though the treatment is the same, which is GABA agonists, in particular benzodiazepines. In some cases, benzodiazepines may be insufficient, at which point you would need to graduate to barbiturates like phenobarbital or potentially propofol if they're going to be intubated. Cholinergics. So we talk a lot about cholinergics, particularly as it relates to quote unquote nerve agents uh, or the risk of chemical warfare. Um, but overall, uh, they're relatively infrequently encountered in the United States. Uh, there are organophosphate um, pesticides, certainly, uh, that are used on farms primarily and industrial uses, uh, generally not available to the lay public. Uh, however, they can be obtained. Uh, either again through uh, farming communities or uh, internationally from Mexico uh, or may even just be remaining in people's households from years and years ago. So we certainly do see uh, organophosphate toxicity uh, from time to time. The other source would be certain types of mushrooms, as you see pictured here, or clitocybe mushrooms, uh, or quote-unquote sweaters, because they make you sweat. I'm not, not too terribly ingenious there uh, with the naming, but uh, the, the toxicity can be very similar. Fortunately, with the mushrooms, those are primarily going to be short-lived uh, and easily treated symptomatically. So the presentation uh, can be variable, but primarily you're going to be looking at bronchorrhea, bradycardia, diaphoresis, salivation, vomiting, diarrhea, urination. So basically just sort of wet and juicy. These people will just be emanating secretions from everywhere. Um, the reason that I lead with bronchorrhea and bradycardia 
um, with the presentation is because those are the things that actually are dangerous and kill people. Uh, so people will talk about sludge syndrome, um, but I don't like that nomenclature because it doesn't include the bees, which you know sometimes we'll refer to the quote killer bees of cholinergics uh, because of the bronchorrhea, bronchospasm, and bradycardia. Uh, so the treatment for cholinergics uh, of all sorts is going to be atropine and or glycopyrrolate, so muscarinic antagonists, with a primary goal of drying those secretions, primarily the pulmonary secretions. Um, the addi and additional treatments uh, would be pralidoxime or 2-PAM. These would be in the setting of organophosphate or nerve agents, which are associated with um, complete inhibition of, organoph of the uh, cholinesterase, uh, leading to permanent uh, inactivity until your body can produce more. So with nerve agents, uh, it's called aging, where the, the binding to the cholinesterase enzyme becomes covalent and therefore irreversible. Uh, with nerve agents, this can happen in a matter of minutes. Typically, when you're talking about organophosphates, it occurs over the course of approximately 24 hours. Uh, so the goal with pralidoxime is early therapy. With cladicide mushrooms, uh, things like pralidoxime would actually not end up being necessary because they don't cause aging. Um, other carbamate uh, uh, pe uh, pesticides, such as seven or carbaryl, uh, that we can obtain in places like Home Depot, uh, again, those don't cause aging. So primarily the treatment is going to be atropine, zofran, and other symptomatic uh, therapy. So those are some basic toxidromes, um, but in general, following an overdose or presumed overdose, how do I approach a patient who presents to my emergency department, I suppose my office or the hospital, uh, following an ingestion? And in this lecture, we really are focusing on the acute toxicity of ingestion as opposed to uh, chronic abuse and substance uh, abuse and dependence, which are an entire, entirely uh, separate uh, topic that would require their own uh, lecture. So, as with anything, a detailed history is probably going to be our most important uh, diagnostic tool. Uh, certainly, we want to be aware of any prescribed medications, both that the patient has access to personally, but within the household. So, what prescriptions do parents, siblings, spouses, children uh, have in the house that the patient could have accessed, as well as illicit medication. So patients may or may not be up front uh, with this, and that is where ancillary information from EMS providers, uh, family members, friends can be very useful. Uh, certainly a history of ethanol abuse or withdrawal uh, or chronic dependence would be useful as well. Street drugs, supplements, so over-the-counter supplements that you can get from GNC, um, you know, weight gaining supplements, energy supplements, uh, use of those can be important as well as naturally occurring toxins. So um, foraging for mushrooms, things like that. So you really want to delve into anything that uh, patients may have been exposed to. Uh, in some cases, patients may not be completely upfront, like I said. Other times they may not mention things because they don't think of them as a potential danger. Uh, so you really want to dig deep with those types of things and that can be where your answer lies. Physical exam, obviously, uh, is the next most important thing uh, in diagnosing these patients. In toxicology, we really focus on, obviously, the vital signs and the neurologic examination. Of course, cardiovascular examination, pulmonary, GI exam are all going to be very important. But most of our answers come from vitals, um, bradycardia, tachycardia, hyperhypotension, respiratory rate as an indication potentially for underlying metabolic acidosis, or decreased respiratory rate in the case of opioid toxicity, and temperature, as I described before, um, as hyperthermia is often a dangerous sign in the acutely poisoned patient. Beyond that, the neurologic examination, obviously looking at mental status, uh, delirium, uh, also looking at reflexes, so looking for hyperreflexia or sustained clonus as an indicator uh, of toxicity as well. As far as tests that we recommend, pretty much most toxicologists agree that in any ingestion, especially if it's an unknown ingestion uh, or poison patient, uh, the two major tests that should always be obtained are acetaminophen levels and EKGs. And that's for a couple of different reasons. One is acetaminophen can be deadly but have very few and potentially no initial symptoms within the first few hours of presentation. But if you don't initiate therapy early on, it can lead to potentially deadly liver injury. So we want to have an acetaminophen level uh, early in the process, even if there's no symptoms or history of acetaminophen ingestion. 
The other test, the EKG, is non-invasive, it's inexpensive, and it can provide significant information. So when a toxicologist is looking at an EKG, what we're primarily looking at is the rhythm and then interval, so the QRS duration and the QTC interval. And that is because many drugs and toxins uh, affect sodium channels or potassium channels, leading to prolongation in either the QRS or QTC, which can lead to potentially life-threatening dysrhythmias. So because it's inexpensive, it gives important information, we do recommend EKGs in nearly all, if not all, um, poisoning exposures. Beyond that, we generally recommend a salicylate level, as again, uh, salicylate poisoning may, in the early stages, not be uh, obvious, uh, though it usually is associated with fairly significant symptoms, it may not be. Uh, ethanol as well, if somebody is altered, we certainly want to know if ethanol is playing a role, uh, or to what degree withdrawal may eventually complicate their clinical course. CHEM7 uh, is useful primarily looking at kidney function, potentially sodium, as some uh, agents, particularly serotonergic agents, are associated with hyponatremia, and then bicarbonate, as metabolic acidosis is something uh, that we're very closely evaluate in multiple different toxidromes. Rhabdomyolysis is a common complication of uh, toxicity, so a CPK, particularly in a patient who's been down for a prolonged period of time or extremely agitated requiring restraint, uh, CPK uh, would make sense to obtain. Osmolality as needed, and typically this is going to be an evaluation for toxic alcohols, particularly in centers where toxic alcohol levels can't be easily obtained. Uh, for interpretation of that, you'd have to uh, look up uh, equations to determine the osmolality gap. Um, ABGs or venous blood gases in selected cases, again, particularly in the setting of severe acidosis, uh, severe agitation, uh, that can be useful. Salicylate toxicity is another type of toxicity where frequent gases will be necessary. Radiology, consider chest x-ray, particularly when aspiration is a concern. Aspiration, pneumonitis, and potentially pneumonia are very common complications of uh, toxicity, either from agitation or uh, decreased level of consciousness uh, because of inability to protect the airway, vomiting, uh, and aspiration of GI contents. And then head CT. Uh, head CT certainly aren't necessary in all cases, uh, but would be considered uh, if there is a reasonable history of trauma, evidence of trauma, uh, or if uh, there is altered mental status that can't be fully explained uh, otherwise. Specialized testing, obviously uh, there are multiple available drug levels that can be useful, uh, lithium, carbamazepine levels, uh, phenytoin levels uh, that do come to mind that I wouldn't routinely check unless I knew the patient uh, was taking those medications and the presentation was consistent with toxicity from those medications. Uh, basic urine drug screens we'll, uh, I'll talk about in just a minute. Uh, they're useful for confirmation of your suspected toxidrome, but not as a diagnostic tool typically. And then there is a urine comprehensive drug screen, which is done by gas chromatography mass spectroscopy. And uh, urine is the best source for checking that. Serum is nearly useless and much more expensive. Uh, and this is more of a fingerprint. It'll give you uh, specific chemicals that were ingested. But again, these are expensive. They take time to run. And by the time they're back, treatment should have already been initiated. So again, they're more for confirmatory and reporting purposes uh, than they are for truly diagnostic purposes. Purposes. So getting to drug screens, we tend to uh, focus on obtaining urine drug screens uh, and using them for uh, various reasons in the treatment of patients, but I would argue that uh, a drug screen is almost useless in the acute management of an intoxicated patient. Uh, they may be useful in the follow-up psychosocial evaluation of the patient and eventual disposition and potentially psychiatric evaluation. Uh, however, for acute intoxication, they're nearly useless. Uh, if somebody is agitated and combative, tachycardic, hypertensive, uh, I don't generally need a drug screen to come back positive for cocaine or amphetamines to tell me that they may be sympathomimetic. Uh, at the same time, there are a lot of false positives and false negatives. So particularly with tricyclic antidepressant screens, many different drugs can trigger those, uh, but do sometimes lead to confusion for physicians who um, specifically focus on TCAs when it may be diphenhydramine or another antihistamine that triggered it. 
Uh, and the same is true for false negatives. Um, patients will have a negative benzodiazepine or opioid screen despite having overdosed on a synthetic opioid uh, similar to oxycodone or hydrocodone that may not trigger the screen or benzodiazepines such as lorazepam which may not trigger the benzodiazepine screen. Uh, so they can have utility as long as you understand those limitations. So I never wait for the results to initiate treatment and you're obviously always treating the patient and what they're demonstrating, not the drug screen. Other basic therapeutic principles, as with anything in medicine, A, B, C, D, so airway, breathing, circulation, whatever you would normally do to support those is probably going to be appropriate in the setting of a, a tox patient as well. Uh, the D I throw in there is dextrose. Hypoglycemia certainly can masquerade as toxicity. Patients can be agitated, diaphoretic, delirious uh, uh, with hypoglycemia. So a bedside uh, glucose or administration empirically of dextrose if there's a high level of suspicion uh, is always appropriate. Gastric decontamination, this is sort of a, a common question that we receive. Uh, is it useful? When should we do it? Activated charcoal uh, is still potentially a useful therapy. However, there are a lot of um, relative contraindications to its use. I would argue that typically we would not use it outside of one hour. Uh, Within one hour, it has been shown to uh, decrease levels in the serum. However, it has not truly been shown to improve mortality or outcomes. So you can consider whether or how useful it actually is. Um, the other concern is it is associated with risk, primarily of aspiration. So within one hour, if somebody is overdosed on a potentially dangerous or life-threatening agent, they're awake oriented, willing to drink the charcoal, then I would consider using it. If any of those things are not true, then I would not administer activated charcoal. I have reviewed trip sheets from EMS where they document a patient who is unresponsive, uh, agonal respirations, and the next step is that they administer charcoal. My first question is how? Uh, they must have just squeezed it into this patient's mouth, uh, hoping that it would go down the right hole. And I can tell you from seeing these patients, it did not. Uh, so we end up suctioning the stuff out of patients' lungs for days. Uh, so it, it definitely has potential risks and danger. Uh, the corollary to that is gastric lavage. Uh, again, this is sort of uh, commonly referred to as, quote, pumping the stomach. So I will see patients, you know, uh, uh, intoxicated adolescents whose parents will come in and ask if, if we have or are going to, quote, pump their kid's stomach. Uh, and I have to let them know that that's a very dangerous, potentially dangerous procedure uh, with very little utility. So true gastric lavage doesn't involve placing an NG tube and just suctioning out what you can from the stomach uh, because we're usually talking about pill fragments um, and an NG tube will not be able to suction out pill fragments. So true gastric lavage involves placing a 36 French Ewald tube, uh, so larger than a chest tube, so therefore it has to be an orogastric tube about the size, slightly smaller than a garden hose. Uh, in order to do that, you have to intubate the patient. So you're exposing the risk of intubation. Um, it's a traumatic procedure, certainly esophageal, gastric injuries and perforations have been well reported. Uh, its utility drops precipitously throughout the first hour to the point where at one hour, there's essentially no yield from gastric lavage. And even at a half hour, you're at about 50% yield. So it's very unlikely you'd be able to accomplish it in time to actually uh, have benefit. Uh, the other thing that has actually been shown is it will, has been shown to push drug in the stomach post-pylorically uh, and actually enhance rapid uh, absorption, uh, thereby potentially worsening toxicity. If you do do it and it's placed, the, the way to then do it is then suction what's in the stomach and then lavage with one to two liters of saline, suction that out, and instill charcoal. Um, I can tell you I've done this in one case, and in that patient, uh, they were hypothermic uh, at a temperature of 29 with gastric atony, so they, their stomach wasn't moving at all. Hours afterwards, we did a CT scan because the patient was being evaluated for trauma, and we saw a bunch of pills just still sitting in the stomach. So in that one particular specific case, we did it and actually got back about 20 tablets of labetalol, uh, which could have been potentially fatal, so it probably was useful then. So if you're considering it, I would call a poison center or toxicologist, but for the most part, I would not recommend gastric lavage.
For patients who are agitated, as I've said before, benzodiazepines are the treatment of choice. Um, rarely we will administer antipsychotics if we suspect dopaminergic toxicity as well. So if they're adequately sedated but still have that crack dancing that I was describing before with their arms moving and their heads going back and forth, uh, then you can give small doses. We recommend haloperidol, uh, 2.5 to 5 milligrams at a time. Uh, for tox-induced seizures, again, benzodiazepines, uh, and moving quickly to barbiturates and or propofol if they're intubated, uh, and then pyridoxine. So GABA agonist therapy is the treatment for tox-induced seizures. Pyridoxine is sort of the final step as some toxidromes, um, isoniazid in particular, are associated with uh, relative inactivity of pyridoxal phosphate and uh, metabolism of glutamate to GABA. So by administering pyridoxine, you can bypass that inhibition and thereby replenishing your own endogenous GABA. We do not recommend dilantin or phenytoin for tox-induced seizures, uh, as that's rarely effective. In the to in, uh, in toxicity associated with uh, QRS widening from sodium channel blockade, uh, we usually are looking for a QRS wider than 120 milliseconds, and the prototypical drug that we're talking about here are tricyclic antidepressants. When we see that, we recommend uh, administration of sodium bicarbonate, uh, usually large amounts. So two to three amps at a minimum to start with, and typically what you'll see is rapid narrowing of the QRS. At times, you may need to give up to four, five, six amps uh, in an adult uh, before you start to see that effect. And the idea behind that is, one, it raises pH, thereby increasing protein binding and decreasing tissue distribution, uh, but also adds a hypertonic saline to the, uh, the milieu uh, and provides a competition for those sodium channels. We typically will follow that then with a sodium, or with a sodium bicarbonate infusion. Uh, the way to make that is three amps and one liter of D5W not D5 normal or half normal because that would create uh, a hypertonic saline uh, that may be dangerous uh, as far as increasing sodium and tonicity. Uh, we also add 30 to 40 milliequivalents of potassium chloride to that uh, since the sodium bicarbonate will cause intracellular uh, movement of potassium uh, leading to potentially dangerous hypokalemia. We then titrate that to a pH of 7.55. Lidocaine can be used for refractory ventricular dysrhythmias. Uh, it is a sodium channel blocker itself, but a type 1B and therefore safe. So we'd rather use lidocaine and have that displace potentially dangerous sodium channel blockers like tricyclic antidepressants. Uh, hypotension uh, in the tox patient. Uh, we will, uh, if you suspect beta blocker or calcium channel blocker toxicity, uh, you can start with glucagon, though that's often not going to be effective. Uh, we then uh, move on to epinephrine and or norepinephrine. It's important to remember that there is no maximum dose. Uh, we're talking about competitive inhibition here, uh, so we're looking to overcome that blockade. So you need to give super therapeutic doses to overcome that. Uh, dopamine we rarely use as it's an indirect agonist, uh, and we prefer to use direct agonists. Specifically for calcium channel blockers and potentially beta blockers, high-dose insulin may be useful, um, but I recommend consultation with the toxicologist prior to instituting that therapy. So resources, if you come across a poison patient and uh, you're looking for help with either the diagnosis and or treatment, uh, poison control centers are a wonderful resource. Uh, they're located across the country um, and are all backed up by 24-7 toxicologist coverage. So if you're looking to speak to a physician toxicologist, you can access them through the poison center if you don't have a toxicologist associated with your facility. Uh, the number 1-800-222 1222 is a national 800 number and will refer you directly to the poison center that covers your geographical area. So moving on to some common specific and life-threatening uh, toxicities. Acetaminophen is responsible for more hospitalizations uh, than overdose of all other drugs combined, and it's the most common cause of acute liver failure in the United States, not worldwide, but in the United States, followed by viral hepatitis. So it's found in combination with many other drugs, obviously Percocet, Vicodin, Lortab, things like that associated with opioids, diphenhydramine, Tylenol PM as an example, as well as various formulations of over-the-counter uh, acetaminophen. 
Uh, the pathophysiology, so in every dose that we take of acetaminophen, it's metabolized through glucuronidation and sulfation, with a small amount going through the cytochrome P450 system, specifically 2E1, forming N-acetylbenzoquinonamine, uh, or NAPTI. Uh, that is a toxic metabolite, which is uh, highly reactive and can cause local injury to uh, cells in which it's made, primarily the liver. Normally, uh, at, lo at normal therapeutic doses, we have sufficient glutathione to detoxify NAPKI so that it doesn't cause injury. However, with overdose, we overwhelm our ability to detoxify it, and that's when we start to see uh, local tissue injury. Uh, so I apologize, it's a misprint here. It should be four stages of, of acetaminophen toxicity. Uh, stage one, so in the first eight to 12 hours, patients may have some nausea and vomiting after taking large numbers of pills, uh, but many times are fairly asymptomatic, and that's why checking an acetaminophen level in the setting of acute overdose is so important. Uh, usually by stage two, 12, and into 36 hours, uh, GI symptoms will start to progress, uh, and, you may, and that's when we'll start to see uh, rises in transaminases, uh, particularly AST, which is most sensitive. Stage three is 36 to 72 hours. Uh, you get progressively worsening liver injury, rising transaminases, uh, potentially encephalopathy, uh, and in the sickest of patients, you can see a SERS-type uh, physiology with distributive shock. And then by stage four, 72 to 96 hours, uh, is when we'll start to see maximal hepatotoxicity, including potential fulminant hepatic failure. Uh, so it does occur rapidly, and when these patients start to get sick, they get sick quickly uh, and require very aggressive uh, supportive care. So the evaluation primarily uh, surrounds the RUMAC Matthew nomogram, the gold standard for diagnosing potentially dangerous uh, acetaminophen toxicity is a four-hour acetaminophen level. Uh, so a four-hour level above 150 in the United States and Canada uh, is considered a potentially dangerous or toxic and would necessitate therapy. After four hours, we plot the level on the graph, uh, which is um, with time, which is on the x-axis and the y-axis re representing the level. If it falls above that treatment line, then we treat with antidotal therapy. If it falls below, then we consider the patient uh, clear. If the timing is unknown uh, with a positive acetaminophen level, we have to assume that it could be toxic and we recommend treatment. Or if there is new liver injury in a patient who previously had a healthy liver, uh, regardless of acetaminophen uh, uh, level, we often recommend therapy in the setting of an unknown ingestion. So the treatment, uh, the antidote is N-acetylcysteine, uh, or, and the brand name uh, for the IV uh, formulation is acetidote. Uh, the way it works is it's a glutathione precursor as well as uh, a, redu a reducer of oxidative stress. Uh, it's universally effective in preventing severe liver injury, hepatic failure, and transplant if it started within eight hours of the ingestion. But as we know from uh, what we discussed before, the symptoms may not start until well after eight hours. So that's why it's so important to check a level so that you can start therapy within that window. But you do have time to wait for a four hour level in the setting of the patient who comes in within a couple hours of ingestion and still have time to start therapy uh, with expectation of good outcome. This is the dosing for acetidote. It's a little bit confusing, uh, so I encourage you to either look it up or call a poison center uh, who can fax you the dosing each time that you need to give it. Uh, we recommend continuing it, and by continuing after this first 21-hour infusion, uh, continuing repeated 16-hour uh, infusions of 100 milligrams per kilogram total uh, until we see one of the three um, endpoints. Clinical as well as laboratory improvements, so uh, either the patient's LFTs are improving or, um, or they never bumped in the first place, as well as improving abdominal pain uh, and overall clinical presentation. We, one or the other isn't necessarily enough. We like to see them in combination. Once we see that, we can discontinue therapy uh, with a good prognosis. Uh, otherwise, you continue it if they're continuing to worsen until they're either transplanted or the patient dies. Indications for transplant, 
Uh, and these are still sort of the best studied uh, criteria. Certainly other criteria can be used and are being looked at for additional sensitivity and specificity for patients that require transplant. Uh, but these are still good baseline criteria uh, to indicate who you should be worried may require transplant or referral to a transplant center. Uh, so these are the King's College criteria based on where they were derived. Uh, you'll notice that the most important indicator uh, is a pH less than 7.3. So metabolic acidosis by itself is the most dangerous predictive factor uh, following acetaminophen ingestion. And this is a pH after volume resuscitation. So an initial pH of 7.25 that is mostly due to dehydration that immediately resolves with uh, no treatment other than volume resuscitation uh, wouldn't fall in this category. But with adequate resuscitation, if they have a persistent metabolic acidosis with pH less than 7.3, that in and of itself is technically a, um, an indication for transplant. The other criteria are a combination of a PT greater than 100, a creatinine greater than 3.3, and a grade 3 or 4 encephalopathy. And you'll notice that transaminases are not on this list. Uh, so you can see very marked elevations in transaminases in the tens of thousands uh, in patients who do not require transplant. Or you can see relatively modest uh, transaminase elevations into the high uh, thousands or maybe low 10,000s in patients who do require transplant. Uh, so uh, that, that is not part of our criteria typically, though we do use that as a potential indicator for liver injury um, in combination with these other factors. And again, the grade three or four encephalopathy is a clinical indicator uh, independent of a patient's ammonia level, though certainly they may have a hyperammonemia. Uh, another common uh, clinical scenario that is encountered by many physicians that treat patients uh, in the hospital in particular or even in the primary care setting is alcohol withdrawal. Uh, so initial studies in 1912 reported a 52% mortality uh, for patients with delirium tremens, and sometimes we'll still see that number quoted uh, of a 50% mortality. The truth is, um, currently with our intensive supportive care and treatment regimens, uh, that mortality risk is much, much lower, probably on the order of 1% to 2%, but is still there and still very real. Uh, and left unchecked and without treatment, that's when you potentially could see that close to 50% mortality. Uh, alcohol withdrawal syndrome is a very common uh, syndrome, so you know, lifetime risk, one to three percent of men uh, surveyed describe one or more symptoms of alcohol withdrawal syndrome, even if mild. Uh, Eight percent of general hospital admissions, 16 percent of post-surgical patients, and 31 percent of trauma patients uh, will develop alcohol withdrawal syndrome. So it's a very commonly encountered problem. Pathophysiology of alcohol withdrawal is a combination primarily of two uh, neurotransmitter receptor uh, uh, couplings. The GABA receptor is the primary responsible receptor, so ethanol is a, is a GABA agonist. So with chronic uh, large volume exposure, uh, GABA receptors try to maintain an equilibrium by down-regulating as well as changing their uh, protein uh, structure conformation to make them less sensitive to GABA agonists. Uh, to prevent uh, severe sedation. However, when you remove that GABA agonism, um, the chronic stimulus, your own endogenous uh, GABA uh, agonists are no longer able to maintain that equilibrium, so you'll see a hyperexcitable state. And the same is true of NMDA receptors, but in the opposite way. So NMDA receptors, uh, primarily through glutamate, are one of our main excitatory uh, neuroreceptors. And Ethanol, uh, through glycine-mediated um, activity, uh, leads to inhibition of NMDA receptor activity. So with withdrawal, or over time with dependence, you see an upregulation of NMDA receptors. When you take away its inhibitor, you get further excitability. So the combination leads to uh, the very hyperexcitable state that we associate with alcohol withdrawal. So clinically, what do we see? Uh, alcoholic tremulousness, 
Uh, it's hallmarked by tachycardia, hypertension, tremor, diaphoresis, flushing, a lot of anxiety, a lot of subjective symptoms, uh, but a clear sensorium, and that's very important. So alcohol tremulousness, a patient will be alert, oriented, aware of their surroundings, able to participate in uh, an interview and your evaluation of the patient, and does not represent delirium tremens. This can occur within hours of the last drink of alcohol, uh, and in people who are severely dependent on ethanol, can occur while ethanol is still in their system. So the presence of ethanol doesn't rule out the potential for uh, initiation of alcohol withdrawal. Alcoholic hallucinosis, uh, again, independent of delirium, is visual or tactile hallucinations associated with withdrawal. Uh, so, uh, you know, visual hallucinations, which can range from, I've seen patients who report seeing blood dripping down the walls to uh, seeing Bengal tigers in the room or little people with machine guns trying to shoot them are all examples of visual hallucinations I've seen uh, in, pe in patients I've been treating. But again, they're able to tell me that in a lucid way, so they're not delirious, they're simply having hallucinations. And then formication or tactile feeling like bugs are crawling on them is a very common uh, hallucination as well. More dangerous uh, manifestations of alcohol withdrawal uh, include seizures. So approximately 10% of patients who suffer alcohol withdrawal uh, may have a complication of withdrawal seizure. Uh, they may or may not have significant symptoms leading up to the seizure. In some cases, they'll be relatively asymptomatic and suddenly have a seizure. In other cases, they'll have the typical tremulousness symptoms leading to the seizure. Um, typically, they are isolated. Uh, single generalized tonic-clonic seizures is very rare to have status epilepticus or focal seizures, partial seizures. A focal or partial seizure would be more indicative of um, a CNS anatomic lesion or underlying seizure disorder. Certainly, in the presence of a CNS focus of seizure activity, alcohol withdrawal can lower that seizure threshold and, and predispose the patient to having that partial seizure, but it probably would not be from alcohol withdrawal alone. Uh, and again, that may be the presenting symptom of patients. Interestingly, some patients will have withdrawal symptoms, have a seizure, and following the seizure have a marked improvement in their symptoms. Um, but again, these patients will need ongoing treatment and monitoring uh, for potential further manifestations of withdrawal. And then delirium tremens, and this is really the dan most dangerous, uh, as we discussed, manifestation of alcohol withdrawal. Typically, uh, you wouldn't expect to see this until 36 to 48 hours after the last drink um, and should be resolving by about 96 hours or five days after the last drink. Uh, and that's important to know as you're treating a delirious patient for alcohol withdrawal. As you're getting to that day four or five, uh, you know that their alcohol withdrawal as an etiology for delirium must be resolving. Any ongoing delirium that you may be seeing is likely related to ICU, infection, or encephalopathy related related to the medications you've needed to treat them with. Uh, so the hemodynamic findings can be similar to tremulousness, tachycardia, hypertension, hyperreflexia, uh, but this patient will be delirious. They won't be able to participate, to focus, you know, wax and wane, and all the other typical findings of delirium. So the mortality is primarily associated with uh, the adverse sequelae, including aspiration, pneumonia, pneumonitis, pulmonary emboli, MIs, seizures, rhabdo, acute renal failure, and other hospital-acquired infections, not the withdrawal itself. So uh, we need to be very vigilant in watching for these adverse sequelae. Therapy, the hallmark of therapy is GABA agonists. Uh, so benzodiazepines are the gold standard, whether that be lorazepam or diazepam. Uh, it, as long as you're giving a GABA agonist, that is the primary uh, therapy. In some patients, they have be developed such a tolerance and such a change in their GABA receptor physiology that they may be resistant to even very large doses, getting into gram doses of diazepam, for instance, at which point uh, phenobarbital uh, is an appropriate um, uh, medication to move to. In some cases, you may not even wait to give that much benzodiazepine before moving to phenobarbital. Uh, that has a very um, effective uh, treatment profile. The potential risk with phenobarbital and other barbs is that it has a much more narrow safety or therapeutic index, whereas with benzodiazepine, it has a very broad therapeutic index. So if you happen to give a bit too much, it's unlikely to cause an adverse effect. 
Propofol certainly can be used, but its limitations are that it's short acting and the patient uh, would almost certainly need to be intubated. And the use of ethanol is not recommended uh, at this point for all the risks associated with ethanol therapy, including um, vein injury, tachycardia, dysrhythmias, gastritis, hypoglycemia, metabolic acidosis, uh, and not even to mention the potential ethical uh, uh, issues with using ethanol. Beta blockers, anticonvulsants, antipsychotics, central alpha-2 agonists like clonidine, dexmedetomidine uh, have all been looked at, but thus far would be considered inferior to GABA agonist therapy. Different ways of doing it, you can do sanding doses. Typically, we wouldn't recommend starting standing doses until uh, you've established uh, what a patient requires, almost similar to insulin. Uh, we uh, do recommend symptom-triggered dosing based on a withdrawal assessment scale uh, or clinician uh, evaluation based on symptoms and signs of withdrawal uh, to give intermittent doses of benzos as needed. Uh, we recommend front-loading with IV diazepam, which is a uh, rapid onset but long-acting with active metabolites benzodiazepine, uh, starting with 10 to 20 milligrams as, as a dose initially, but rapidly titrating up, oftentimes requiring hundreds of milligrams of uh, diazepam. And following that, symptom trigger dosing, again, based on a withdrawal assessment scale, uh, which is standardized. And typically, we recommend a scale that includes vital signs and other objective measures, not just subjective. And then other adjunctive therapy, thiamine, folate, multivitamin, because of malnutrition and vitamin deficiency associated with chronic alcohol abuse, as well as dextrose supplementation, uh, given the uh, poor nutrition of these patients, diminished glycogen stores, and risk of alcoholic ketoacidosis, um, which can complicate this uh, as a result of ethanol uh, pushing patients towards a ketosis, uh, treatment being dextrose. Uh, also, we recommend its treatment or its administration in conjunction with high dose thiamine. Finally, salicylate toxicity I'll cover briefly. Um, it is not as common as acetaminophen or alcohol withdrawal, but still widely seen as it's so easily available. Uh, it is the eighth most common cause of death from toxic exposures. Uh, it's easily obtained as uh, component many over-the-counter prescription analgesics. Also, oil of wintergreen, which is often used for the smell um, and a liniment, uh, but if ingested, contains a large amount of methyl salicylate, such that even a teaspoon, teaspoon can be deadly to a child. The pathophysiology, essentially the way that it works is uncoupling oxidative phosphorylation, leading to expenditure of energy as heat rather than uh, creation of ATP. So you get diminished ATP production, uh, hyperthermia, um, but not necessarily a lactate-associated acidosis because it doesn't inhibit the electron transport chain. It just uncouples it by moving uh, hydrogen ions through the inner mitochondrial membrane but bypassing the ATP synthase. Clinical presentation, nausea, vomiting, uh, because it is highly irritating to gastric mucosa. Uh, tachypnea and hyperpnea are common. It does um, stimulate your central respiratory drive independent of acidosis. So an early finding would be respiratory alkalosis even before metabolic acidosis presents. Uh, so uh, it is not a compensatory mechanism. Uh, so patients may have a normal rate but breathing very heavily, which would be hyperpnea. They may or may not be aware of it. Another finding or symptom is tinnitus. Uh, it directly causes a tinnitus reaction, so people will hear either ringing or whooshing in their ears, or they just won't hear as well, or things will sound far away. Uh, it's a real common symptom of salicylate toxicity. Typically, they'll be tachycardic from vomiting and insensible losses. They will be uh, volume depleted. Hyperthermia, as I said, because of the uncoupling of oxidative phosphorylation, they get release of energy as heat. Altered mental status and seizures uh, portend very bad outcome and potentially rapid deterioration to death uh, as salicylate concentration in the brain is most associated with, uh, with mortality. And so any alteration in mental status or seizure should be very aggressively treated, though even when it is aggressively and appropriately treated may, uh, may not be able to be salvageable. So evaluation, blood gases, we'd expect a mixed respiratory and alkalosis as well as metabolic acidosis. Again, both are primary uh, derangements, not necessarily compensatory. Uh, early on, we expect a respiratory alkalosis with the metabolic acidosis progressing uh, throughout the course. We recommend checking serial salicylate levels. It does have erratic and delayed absorption through bezoar formation within the stomach. Uh, 
It also follows Michaelis Menten kinetics, meaning it goes to zero order kinetics, so it does not have a half life, so it's very slowly eliminated while also being continuously absorbed. Uh, following the glucose closely, because of the hypermetabolic state, even with poor ATP production, glucose and glycogen stores are rapidly depleted, so you want to ensure the patients have adequate glucose uh, for what energy production they are able to maintain, uh, following CHEM7 for both kidney function as well as bicarbonate and chest x-ray. Particularly with chronic salicylate toxicity, non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema has been associated with it. And then treatment. Uh, the primary uh, treatment uh, is sodium bicarbonate, and the, the goal here is to alkalinize the serum, not necessarily the urine. Uh, so by alkalinizing the serum, we increase the amount of uh, salicylate that's in the ionized form. When salicylate is ionized, it has actually a decreased volume of distribution leading to decreased penetration to the CNS where it's the most deadly. When it's trapped in the serum, it allows for greater uh, filtration and elimination through urinary mechanism. A secondary benefit of alkalinizing the serum through uh, sodium bicarbonate in a very similar way that we use it for sodium channel blocker cardiotoxicity uh, is the alkalinization of urine, which again traps the ions in the urine and does not allow reabsorption of the more lipophilic, non-ionized uh, salicylate. Finally, hemodialysis uh, can be used as salicylate is dialyzable. Uh, indications would be renal failure, as it is pretty much an indication always for dialysis, but particularly in the setting of salicylate toxicity. As I said, altered mental status and seizures portend such a bad outcome uh, that the presence of that would make me think seriously about moving immediately to dialysis. Inability to tolerate large volume resuscitation, which is going to be necessary uh, to maintain an adequate pH uh, to keep the uh, salicylate ionized. Uh, if they have cardiogenic shock, uh, non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema, such that uh, because of third space and they're unable to tolerate the volume, they may require dialysis. And then finally, levels are more of a relative indication. Uh, so an acute level of 100 milligrams per deciliter or a chronic level of 60, uh, which would be associated with higher tissue burden, uh, are, are historic or classic indications for dialysis. I use those more as a general marker. If I'm approaching those levels, it makes me consider dialysis more strongly in somebody in whom I'm on the fence, but in and of themselves aren't necessarily absolute indications. The other thing to be sure of is the, that the units are milligrams per deciliter, um, as milligram per liter units of 150 would be the equivalent of 15 milligrams per deciliter and not toxic, but therapeutic. So that is a very rapid rundown of toxicology, sort of 101, uh, the general approach to the patient, common toxidromes, uh, general treatment of the poisoned patient, regardless of the toxin, as well as uh, an overview of the treatment of some very common uh, toxicities. Uh, certainly there are much more in-depth details for uh, treatment of these and a lot more uh, issues, but that will certainly help, uh, help you get started with the treatment of tox patients, and I certainly recommend uh, calling your local poison center uh, when you see these patients. Not only um, can we provide help with the diagnosis and treatment, it actually helps with the overall surveillance nationwide of poisoning, poisoning exposures and deaths uh, that help to guide our public health initiatives. Uh, so there is a multi-fold purpose to calling the poison center, so we highly encourage it. Uh, I thank you for your time.